My name's Nikki Clayton and I'm Professor of Comparative Cognition at the University of Cambridge in the Psychology Department. I'm also a scientist in residence at Rombert, the dance company in London. The Rombert? Rombert, yeah. Well, well, the, the, it's the name, R-A-M-B-E-R. So it's, it was called Ballet Rombert originally and then it became Rombert Dance Company and most recently they changed their name again to just Rombert. Okay, but because do, it's do, dancers you're... and an orchestra, oh. and it's ninety years old this year. We've just celebrated our ninetieth birthday. Okay, really. So, but you are a scientist in residence at a ballet company. That's correct. Yes. Well, ballet and contemporary dance. Yeah. What? Why do they need a scientist? <laughs> what is science? Um, well, I do various things, but mainly I collaborate with Mark Baldwin, who's a world-famous choreographer and artistic director of the company. And we've worked on five choreographic works together. Um, one about evolution, called The Comedy of Change. One that was about crows and children and the power of play, um, called Seven for a Secret Never to be Told. One about sexual conflict, which was called What Wild Ecstasy. Um, so that's three of them. And the most recent one that we're doing, which will premiere shortly in July, in fact, is called The Creation, based on Haydn's creation. It's about the origin of life and the origin of time. So it's oh, really? very movement-based. So that's some of the sorts of things that I do at the company. And I also work with some of the dancers on their individual choreographic projects. Okay, so what's the, what, what's the, where do you put the emphasis, on the science or the dance? It's the integration of the two. Um, it's about using ideas from science to inspire new choreographic works. So it's quite an interesting thing to do. And um, Clive Wilkins, with whom I collaborate on the Captured Thought and um, Dance Tango, we wrote a paper together with um, another of my colleagues, Kevin Leyland, on the evolution of dance, which was published quite recently in Current Biology. So all the work is interrelated. It's about, I'm, I suppose I'm a movement junkie, really. I, I love to move, I love to dance, and my science and art is really inspired by my love of dance and my love of birds, because I've always wanted to be a bird. I've always wanted to fly. And I have invisible wings, you know. <laughs> yeah, I can see them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let me go back to, to uh, your professor at Cambridge U University. Um, so, so what? what uh, can you tell me what what this exactly is? Your um, department. What, what do you teach? Um, well, I'm based in a department of psychology these days, although my training initially was in zoology, so I read zoology at Oxford University, but I've always been interested in the interface between biology and psychology because I'm interested in how birds think. So the zoological aspect of it is because of the birds and the psychological aspect of it is that I'm interested in cognition. I'm interested in what's it like to think without words, as well as what it's like to think with words, which is something that I explore scientifically in terms of the ability of birds in general and members of the crow family in particular, um, and their cognitive abilities, their problem solving. Really? So, so uh, your, your uh, inspiration comes from zoology? Well, and, and, and the, on the other part from psychology. Yeah. And, and, and you combine it with trying to find out how birds can think. Well, crows in particular, because crows are extremely intelligent. They've got huge brains for their body size. In fact, relative to body size, their brains are as large as those of chimpanzees. And we know that they are extremely good problem solvers. Um, the kinds of things that I've been investigating are... Um, whether these birds are capable of remembering the past and thinking about the future. So in other words, can they, like us, mentally travel backwards and forwards in time to remember specific past episodes and to imagine and crucially plan for future 
scenarios. Okay, uh, let, let me go back to define first. What, what in your opinion is, and then um, without uh, thinking about birds, but what do you think is thinking? Well, I would define cognition as the ability to problem solve. And it involves a series of skills. But the kinds of things that I would, I would want to include would be mental time travel and theory of mind. So these two skills are related. So mental time travel is about being able to think about other times so times other than the here and now, hence past and future. And theory of mind is the ability to think about other minds. So I, if I have theory of mind, then I can understand that your perspective will be similar to mine in some regards, but in other ways it will be crucially different. And the idea that I could put myself in your shoes and imagine what you're thinking would be theory of mind. So I think they're two important thinking skills. Yeah, that thinking skills, but, but uh, um, when you want to define what is thinking, what is thinking? Well, as I've said, I think or, it's or problem what, solving. It's problem solving. And so what, what is a thought? So a thought is the ability to project the mind, you know. If I, so the problem with just defining because it's problem solving is I could say, well, one, one problem I've got here is I'm thirsty. I want to pick up this cup to drink the water. Now, you could say that the ability to hold the cup and do this allows me to solve the problem of being thirsty. Well, that's a physical task. But the, the point about thinking is that you can play multiple scenarios in the mind without actually executing the task first. So I, I might, having never encountered this kind of object before, be able to think through in the mind's eye without taking any action what is the minimal amount of things I need to do in order to drink the water. So for example with the birds we have a, a water task that involves something similar to this, we call it the Aesop's Fable because it's based on the Aesop's Fable of the thirsty crow and the pitcher and in the fable of course a crow encounters a, a pitcher of water, the water level is too low and so it's it's not within beak reach and what the crow does is she finds some stones and puts the stones into the pitcher to raise the water level to a level at which she can drink. So we can do something similar with our birds, we can present them with a tube that's got some water in. The water level is too low for the birds to just be able to go and reach the water. In fact in our case we don't make the birds thirsty, we float a little tasty worm on top of the water. Now, wax worms or wax moth larvae, as, uh, as they're properly called as a zoologist, are the Belgian truffles of the Corvid world. They really, really love these, and so they're then highly motivated to get these worms. And of course, the worms are out of be reach because the water level's too low. And the bird spontaneously put stones into the water level to raise the water. We can then use a task like that, a basic problem-solving task, to ask, well, how are the birds thinking through this problem? How can they solve these things? So, for example, we could have a series of tubes, only one of which contains water. Maybe in another condition the worm is floating in air, thanks to a bit of blue tack rather than real magic. And in another one the worm is resting on a solid, say, sand. And we can ask whether the birds understand that it, there's no point putting stones into a tube full of air or a tube full of sand. That's not going to change the level of the substrate. It's only going to work with the liquid, with the water. Similarly, we can give them the choice of different kinds of objects to put into the tube and ask whether they understand that it's heavy ones that sink that are actually going to displace the water and therefore allow the water level to rise to a level at which they can then reach the worm whereas if they put hollow ones in or ones that just float that's not going to displace the water so we can do various tests like that to see how they're thinking through the problem and that's our way of trying to get at how they can solve these problems and what they understand about the task yeah but now you are talking about the the, the, the corvid family i'm talking about how the um 
jays and rooks and new Caledonian yeah. crows. Well, I want to come and to that later. Children. <laughs> yeah. But that's yeah. as an example. You asked me, yeah, yeah, yeah. there isn't a set definition. You know, I can't give you four words that nails down what thinking is. Yeah. Because if I try and do that, there's going to be too many caveats to it. You know, yeah, I could give I a whole... That's why I want to try to think out loud what it could possibly be. So that's why and I think the, problem yeah. solving, but one in which you can have sort of internal trial and error and think through a problem is key. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's interesting for me. So first, I would like to try to find out, well, what, what's the area we are talking about? And after that, uh, I would like to talk uh, with you about how do you do your research with uh, crows and, and with, uh, yeah. with children. So, so I think one difference not everything, you see. Not everything about thinking and uh, cognition is very clear to me because our audience is well educated but they are not scientists so uh, that's why we have to, tr to, to, to uh, uh, talk a little bit about what are we talking about. <laughs> yes, well, you know, the reason I gave problem solving and said but there are simple ways of problem solving that I wouldn't call thinking would be you could imagine you just do something through trial and error. So, you know, you've no idea what this is. It's a novel object and you push it this way and that doesn't work and you do that and that doesn't work. And eventually, through exploring a number of things, you figure out that the best way to get the cup and drink is to do that action. And then thereafter, you just do more of the same. Well, that's called learning by trial and error or instrumental conditioning is what the psychologist would call that. And most people wouldn't want to call any problem solving that simply occurred through learning by trial and error or instrumental conditioning, cognition. They would want to say that cognition re requires more than that. It's the ability to actually think through a problem without necessarily having to, to learn about the outcomes first. So that's why I've used that example yeah. as, a, as a distinction. So yeah. what you're usually looking for is to train your animal or your human subject on a particular task until they're doing it. And then you do some kind of transfer test in which really what you're tapping into is what have they understood? And can they do something more than just simple learning by rote? Can they abstract some sort of general rule that tells you that yes, they're, they're actually thinking about it, they're just not automatically doing it. Why are you so interested? interested in this subject, like, about how this, this, this works in your mind? Um, well, I'm, I suppose I'm fascinated by thinking per se. And at one level, I'm really interested in the different kinds of thought processes that um, go on and the extent to which they rely on words or don't rely on words. So um, I say words rather than language because, of course, in humans we have language. And sometimes we think without using words, but I wouldn't want to, to say that that's without language because it's not like you take the bits of the brain that are responsible for language, unscrew them out of the brain, put them on the side and carry on. You're still, all your linguistic skills contribute to all your thought processes with and without words, but the whole idea that we might be able to, the extent to which words enrich our thoughts, but perhaps even more intriguingly, the extent to which they can constrain our thoughts, I think is a fascinating area. Um, and did you say, th uh, you meant, uh, you expressed thinking in words, but... but uh, thinking are, without are, words Oh, as well. without words, so, yeah. so what kind of... Well, ways of thinking. Oh. Um, contemporary dance, visual art are both examples of thinking without words or thinking largely without words. When you see a beautiful painting, it doesn't usually have words on it. And even if it does have a word on it, like the famous, this is not a pipe, even then the, the point is so much more than just the words, right? And similarly in contemporary dance, you, you know, you see a beautiful... Um, series of movements, but words are really secondary. Yes, it's got a title, and yes, there might be a small description in the programme, but the performance is so much more 
or and a beautiful really magic really... effect. You know, that is also largely without words. I mean, the, the patter that goes with the effect is just a small part of the act. The, the, the bit that everybody goes, ah, is when something unexpected happens, when you realise that you can't possibly have seen what you thought you saw and you must have not seen what really happened. So I'm interested ah, so, so. in those juxtapositionings. The uh, beautiful painting is, is uh, you mean that this, the artist had a thought and he tried to express it in colours and... and, and, yes. and, and, and it's yes, and, and, and the way in which you then wonder what the artists actually saw, what they actually thought, why they chose to represent it in that particular way. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and even with words, I mean, I think there's an interesting difference between scientific writing and literary artistic writing because in scientific writing you want to make everything as unambiguous as possible because the whole point of a scientific paper is that strictly speaking anybody should be able to read the method section of the paper and if they had the right skills and facilities they should be able to replicate the findings so in a scientific paper you want to make everything as unambiguous and clear as possible but very often in literary writing you want to make it ambiguous because you want layers to it you, you, you want the words not to be self-explanatory but to generate new thoughts um, and I, th I think that is an interesting contrast so in a way I think in, in really good literature the the words are almost being used in the way notes are used by a composer to you know create a beautiful story to build rich layers of atmosphere much of which is largely word wordless right mm -hmm. i mean you, you can have labels for emotions but there's so much more to love or joy or sorrow than there is to just the label of it you know in the same way as when you see a beautiful piece of Art, you hear a gorgeous piece of music. All these feelings and thoughts, you know, swell up inside you, but the words are only secondary, right? It, it's, there's a subjective experience going on inside the, the mind of the viewer or listener or, or both. And it's a, it's a thought, you think? Is, is it a thought if you see a beautiful painting or a beautiful dance or a beautiful... Yes, I think they're thoughts. He heavily charged emotional thoughts often, but... Conscious thoughts? Um, I think they can be conscious and I think they can be unconscious, right? You can have that unconscious feeling of just, oh, isn't this wonderful? And then you can actually have real conscious things. So. You know, when you were talking earlier about the timing of a storytelling, if, if some sort of dramatic music comes at the wrong time in the experience, you're suddenly very conscious of it, right? All of a sudden, sceptical thoughts come into your head where you think, hmm, that's not right, or I don't believe that. Or you see a bit of a film sequence that's out of sync, and you go, they stuffed up there, didn't they? And all of a sudden, those things that perhaps were, at the, were beforehand just subconscious, you were just sort of enjoying it, but not really questioning your, your thoughts, all of a sudden, it's, it's like a switch, and suddenly you think, hang on a minute. You know, or you're listening to, I don't know, a political politician speaking, and all of a sudden you think, you shifty little, I don't believe you for one minute. So you can be going, and, you know, or I can listen to the dulcet tones of Sir David Attenborough, and I find myself just believing every word he says because he has that kind of a voice. Where if he said, "Nikki, darling, please jump off a cliff right now and commit suicide," I'd, I'd be halfway there before I was even realising it because he's got such a persuasive voice. So you have that constant flip-flopping, I think, between the conscious experience and the unconscious one. I mean, classic case for me is when Clive and I are dancing tango. Um, if you were to say to me afterwards, what steps did you dance or show me that move again? 
I wouldn't remember because when we're dancing, we're in the flow. We're just connected together, moving as one to the music. So I'm not thinking, oh, he wants me to do a, a backward octo now or a gancho. I, I, my brain doesn't work that way. I'm just, I'm just subconsciously just connecting with Clive and just moving together as one in synchrony to the music. I'm not thinking about the moves. And you often, um, and obviously that, that's particularly the case in something like tango where it's such a connected and improvised dance. But even in choreographic sequences, often you know, you, you'll know you hear the rehearsal director saying to one of the dancers, don't overthink it because if you put too much conscious thought, conscious cognition into the process, you ruin the fluidity and the naturalness of the music. So I think there's always an interesting juxtaposition there between the, the conscious and the unconscious thoughts. Oh, that's very, very interesting. And maybe we, um, uh, you could talk about that a little bit later. Um, because um, I, I would like to know, because I just need to know, uh, how do you do your research about thinking? Because uh, our viewer doesn't know anything, so so now in the, in this part, uh, uh, then I would like to feel the surprise that you research crowds. You understand? So you mean you'd like me to talk about an experiment that was surprising? Or? No, no, that, that is not, not that. But but for our viewers. You 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 um, you researched uh, our mind uh, about uh, uh, thinking, uh, but our viewers don't know that you research crows. Crows. Yeah. Okay. So so when I ask you how do you do your research? <laughs> you want me to start with I work with crows. Yeah, for example. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I suppose one way to define thoughts would be that I'm interested in studying the mental lives and that it's the, it's mental movements, I suppose. It's what's going on in the mind that I'm interested in. And I work mainly with humans and with crows. And you might think, well, why crows or things? Surely, you know, monkeys I could understand, but why a crow? Well, crows are extremely intelligent. They have huge brains for the body size. They're as big as chimpanzees. Um, in fact, my husband has coined them feathered apes when it comes to their mental abilities because they're so cognitively impressive. Um, and they're very, they're very observant and very good problem solvers. So we, the way in which we do the experiments are to give them a series of problem solving puzzles, if you like, with a view to trying to systematically vary certain parameters in order to try to get a handle on how they're thinking, how they're solving. But do crowds think? Time. Definitely. How do you know? How do you know that crowds think? Be well, because we can show that they're so good at solving these problems. Um, they can think about the past and the future, for example. Um, we've been able to show in one experiment that they are capable... Do they, do they have memories? They have fantastic memories, yeah. Um, so. Your Clark's Nutcracker, which is an American corvid that lives in Yosemite and up high up in the mountains, hides on average about 30,000 seeds a year and can remember the location of these 30,000 caches. Um, people have tested their memories over periods of nine months and found no evidence of forgetting. So they have really remarkable memories of where they've hidden their stashes. They remember 30,000 yeah. spots yeah. where they yeah. put their seeds. Yeah, so they've got fantastic memories. And 
caching or the ability to hide food is a very um, interesting behaviour for looking at aspects of cognition because you can ask it how good are their memories and you can show that if you remove the seeds so they couldn't possibly be using smell they still go back to those particular places we've been able to show that they don't just remember where the food is hidden they can remember which kinds of food were hidden where and how long ago so they can remember what happened where and when um, we've been able to show that they can even remember which particular individuals were watching when they hid their food and then they'll come back later and move those foods to new hiding places which the potential thieves by definition don't know about the new hiding places. We've shown that when it comes to social awareness they go to great lengths to protect their hidden food from being um, stolen by others. So for example um, we've been able to show that if other birds are watching, not only do they move them to new places when the other birds have come back, but they will also specifically hide the food in shady spots rather than well-lit places, which are much harder for the onlooker to see. And in fact, the way we discovered that was we had a BBC One film crew come. They were filming for a series called The Child of Our Time. And the cameraman got very frustrated because Sweetie Pie, who was a very tame, beautiful scrub jay, would wait and, and only hide food every time the cameraman had to take a, a toilet break. Um, and eventually I had to say to the cameraman, look away and I'll tell you when to stop recording. And that was the only way we could film her. And then we noticed that she was only hiding in the, the places in the um, arena that weren't well lit. And that gave us the idea to actually test, was she specifically choosing shady places when observers were present? And we found that sure enough, if another bird or, or a human was looking, she would selectively cache in the shady spots. And so would all the other birds we tested. Whereas if she was caching in private, she was happy to cache in sunny and shady spots. We've even shown that um, these kind of cache protection tactics that the birds do, so moving the caches, hiding in, in shady spots and so on and so forth, that are only done by experienced birds. Naive birds who've had no experience of stealing caches don't do it. So it's not just a hardwired, um, instinctive ability, um, more evidence that it's theory of mind, that you, once you've had the experience of stealing yourself, you can put yourselves in another's shoes and go, well, if I was that bird, I would be watching where those caches were and I'd come back and steal them, so I better move them to new places. But they only engage in those tactics when they themselves have been thieves. So it's really quite impressive. But, but that sounds very interesting and, and, and uh, you convinced me of, of the, those crowds being very sm smart or, or capable of thinking, of solving problems. But um, what, what are you interested in, interested in, in, in how cr crows, the corporate family, uh, thinks? Or it, does, do you, in the end, want to find out how we think? Both. Both. So I would argue in the same way as if you want to know how a computer works, you wouldn't want to only use an Apple Mac, you'd want to also look at how a PC works and see the similarities and differences in your types of computer in order to have a better understanding of how computers work. In the same way, I'm going to have a better understanding, I think, about how our brains work if I look at similarities and differences between crows and people because they Crows are very distantly related to us. We share a common ancestor with them over 300 million years ago. Mm. Well, we as humans, we as mammals, it depends how you want to, want to look at it, but, but birds and mammals had a common ancestor over 300 million years ago, so there's been a long time in our evolutionary history in which we've been diverging, we've been going down different paths. And the, um, our brains and those of other mammals are layered, so our cortex has six layers to it. Whereas the bird brain is, doesn't have layers, it's nucleated, so 
the analogy might be that a bird brain and a mammalian brain or a human brain, they, they're both full of these nerve cells that are so important for thinking processes. And my analogy would be, if I imagine cakes, the, the bird brain is like a fruit cake and the mammalian brain is like a six-layered Austrian chocolate cake, the Sasha Torte. So they're both made of cake mix, but the structure or the layout, the, the architecture, is actually quite different. So that then raises interesting questions about whether those different neuroarchitectures might, might impose different constraints on our thinking pattern. Well, uh, th what did you learn from the crows so far? Well, uh, many things. So, so firstly, we've learned that they have really sophisticated cognitive abilities. So there are a number of things that were thought to be unique to human beings. So at one time it was said that tool manufacture is uniquely human. And then they've discovered that, well, no chimps use tools. We've now found that um, all the crows that we've tested, all the different species, will happily use tools and even make them even though they don't necessarily use tools in the wild. So New Caledonian crows rely heavily on tools to find food in the wild, but rooks and jays don't, but they will use and make tools in the lab if they're given a task that requires one. Um, also, you can, you can stimulate the, the, the thinking process. Yes, yeah, so, you know, normally a rook has a very long bill and the kinds of foods that they eat um, are usually things like earthworms in the soil. So for that, you don't need a tool, you just need to insert your beak deep into the soil and they have bare patches around their faces, which are probably an adaptation for being able to dig the earthworms and other grubs that are in the soil. But for that, you don't need a, need a tool. But if you give them a, a task in the lab where they will need a tool in order to reach the food, they will happily use tools and make tools. Can, can we see that? Do you, do you have any proof or evidence? or? I can, can show you some video footage um, of rooks spontaneously taking a piece of wire and bending it into a hook to retrieve a bucket that's out of beak reach. And I can show you rooks and jays using stones and other objects to raise the water level to get worms. So the, 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 the so Belgian can, truffle. The Belgian truffle. So we've got, we've got video footage and oh, we can show you all that tomorrow and you oh, can great. have copies, great. copies of anything so you'd like. how do we as humans, our species, benefit from, uh, from what you learned from crows? How do we benefit? Well, I think people are fascinated by animals and you know a, a lot of people would love to go far away and see chimpanzees in the wild making tools and interacting and we all love the Attenborough footage. The whole idea that that these feathered apes are actually in the back garden is pretty pretty stunning I think and that you can actually watch them solving problems in, in action. And it's not just tool use, you know, that was one thing that was levied as uniquely human. We now know it's not. And why is that interesting? Well, it's one of a number of things that we thought was perhaps responsible for how we've come to get our sophisticated cognitive abilities. But if these birds have it too, then we're not unique, so either that means that a lot more animals out there have it than we thought, or it means that only a select few have it, and in which case probably these abilities have evolved in very different animals with very different brains, but probably for a similar reason. And that, that raises the question then, what is that similar reason? Is it because of needing to be innovative problem solvers and therefore to be able to make tools if we need them um, or is it because of our complex social lives the fact that we f form long-term relationships with others um, that we're very good at being able to detect who's honest and who's cheating we're able to form 
alliances and political manoeuvres to strengthen our own chance of, you know, overcoming our enemies. Politics is a good example of that. We know that the chimpanzees form complex relationships, alliances, and can do these kind of primate politics. More recently, we discovered that these corvids, these members of the crow family, like the rooks and the ravens and the jays, can do form these complex social relationships too. Um, so I think it raises... Like, like, can you give examples? Like the, the, these social relations, that, when you compare it to humans, can they fall in love, for example? Well, they pair for life, that's for sure. And um, I've been very worried when I... I, I remember when two of our jackdaws, um, you'll like this because the jackdaws were named after ethologists, so we had Nico Tinbergen <laughs> <laughs> and Conrad Lorenz. And when Conrad Lorenz died, um, the jackdaw Conrad Lorenz, as opposed to the human Conrad Lorenz, um, Nico was absolutely devastated and just stopped eating and did hardly, hardly moved for about a week and I was really worried we were going to lose him. Um, eventually he he was all right, um, but it looked to me like emotional devastation. Of course, it's very, very difficult to know exactly how you would say whether another bird was in love, but certainly in terms of their behaviour, it was it was consistent with being in love and then being bereft. But they 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 usually pair for life, so they form these very stable, long term monogamous relationships. It could, is it also an evolutionary process that they pair for life? Well, certainly in things like jackdaws, it's very important if you're to defend a nest cavity and have offspring, it takes two. And a lone jackdaw does, is right down the bottom of the pecking order. So you don't want to just find a mate, produce young and then go off and then find another one when you, when you need them. You really need to stay as a couple. Um, we also know in the jays, for example, that during the breeding season, the male will feed the female. Um, this courtship feeding is very common in a number of birds. It's just that in the jays, they do it very delicately, which means that we can actually see, and I can show you footage of this, what the male feeds the female. So we can we can actually see the items physically being transferred from his beak to her beak. So we can count what kinds of food and how many, so we can quantify the food sharing. And what we've been able to show in a series of experiments is that the male jay is able to feed the female what she wants, even if that's quite different to what he wants. So, for example, if I've just seen you... Um, eat a whole box of chocolates and it's and then you've maybe left a couple at the end so I'm pretty sure you're full of chocolate even though I like chocolate I could infer that you're done with the chocolates now you're probably going to want something different to eat well the jays can can also do that they can ignore their own desire of what they want in order to cater for what their female wants can you can you say that um, that Thinking is an evolutionary process, so if it, if it develops uh, in, the mind, in the crow's mind or crow's brain, um, uh, can, can you say that our own thinking is developing as well? Is, is, is there... Can you develop thinking? Yes, I mean, you know, young children are not very good at certain aspects of thinking. So, for example, um, children before the age of four don't understand what a lie is because they can't understand that your point of view could be different from my point of view. So there's a famous task called the Sally Ann task, which we'll demonstrate for you tomorrow that illustrates this, where you ask a little child, say there's one dolly that, that has seen an item being hidden in one box, and then that dolly goes out the room, and then the food is then moved from that box to a new box. The little child won't understand that Sally, who'd left the room, doesn't know that the, the toy was moved here, because all Sally saw was it go in the first box. The little child will assume that Sally knows just what she knows, which is that the 
the toy is now in this box, not in that box. Um, and similarly, young children don't have a concept of yesterday and tomorrow. Neither of those things, the ability to think about other minds and to think about other times, those two things don't develop until children reach about the age of four. But I, I mean, uh, of course, in, a, in, a, in people's lives, uh, thinking develops, but I mean, in, for our species, does the thinking develop? It's, say in 100,000 years or in a million years, uh, do we have uh, developed another kind of thinking? Well, that's an program? interesting question, isn't it? The, the extent to which our thinking changes. At one level, you could sort of say, well, look, our, our brains haven't really changed much, you know, since... Um, since the beginning of humans, if you like, and so there's probably a sense in which we're not any more intelligent now than we, so. than we that were then. Well, I'm going to give you two alternative arguments, okay? So the one case would be our brains haven't changed, so probably at least since our ability to read and write, our thinking skills haven't improved. We're probably no more or less intelligent than we were then. The other line of argument would be to say, well, I don't know about whether our intelligence per se has changed, but our thinking patterns may well have done. Um, the whole notion that we live in a digital age, what has that done to our brains? So most people, I think, don't tend to remember telephone numbers anymore. You just pick up your mobile phone and hit your search list and press the button. Um, we have computers and iPhones and iPads that allow us to record information in ways which I think is fundamentally changing how we think. I'll give you just one example in an area that I, that I happen to know about, which of course is dance, and in both contemporary dance and in Ballet, um, when, you, when you develop a new choreographic work, in the olden days, everything used to be written down through particular notation, for example, the Larbon notation. And, of course, there was a bit of ambiguity when you come to reinterpret the story. So if you go back and look at the original for that Primidi Dean Fawn and you want to make a new production as Romba did in 2012 and you, you want to stick as closely to what you you think was meant by the original terminology, it's all a series of, of notations which describe the, the basic moves but obviously there's going to be some ambiguity in what those things mean in the same way as if you're a film maker and you want to develop a new version of a particular series based on a book of course the, there's the information in the book but then there's the layers on top of that that need interpreting but of course these days in dance what most choreographers do is to record it so now you don't have that that same level of interpretation you just watch the the video footage of the piece. So that's a way in which our thinking probably has changed. I th there are a lot of people, it's not my area, but there are a lot of people obviously studying things like how Twitter and Facebook and those forms of social media are affecting the way in which um, our social interactions mm. work. Um, so uh, um, but, but, but can you say that, that if, if our thinking uh, develops, and maybe in the future we will uh, develop another way of thinking? Well, so that's the really exciting question, I think. Um, what is? Well, the question of whether, by understanding more about how we think now, we could find new ways of thinking. So I think that's the golden nugget, that it's very interesting to think with words, and without words, the work that I do with Clive Wilkins on the Capture Thought, one of our big goals, our big picture, Blue Skies question, is whether and to what extent it's possible to think beyond words. And 
that's why we're so interested in looking at the constraints on our cognition and the patterns of thinking to see if that would generate new ways of thinking. Um, I guess it's what, you know, it's, it's one of the main goals of art is to examine ideas. And so I think one of the things we're interested in is looking at constraints on our memories and our perceptions as being the first baby steps in that direction, because that's a blue skies question, you know, we're not going to solve that question, but we might get a, a step closer to it. So it's trying to understand, you know, why is it we miss so much of what happened and we miss so much of what we see? Is, is it? Yeah, and I think that's a really interesting question. Do we miss a lot? Yeah. What, what, can you explain that? What, what, I don't well, know. if we didn't, uh, all magicians would be out of business, wouldn't they? Because a magic effect capitalises on the fact that there are a number of things that go on in a sequence that we miss. If we saw every move that the magician made in executing the fact, it, it wouldn't work as a magic trick. we go, thanks for that. You know, why are you wasting my time? It's the fact that we we know jolly well that that can't, can't literally have vanished in thin air, and yet our eyes and our visual cortex, our mind, is telling us that that's precisely what happens. So it's a challenge between between tricks or magic and uh, and how we think. Well, well, that's just one example. Yeah. Another example would be with memory. Um, and perhaps I don't want to say too much until you catch Clive and I interacting because it's probably more powerful to the two of us, but there's a phrase we really like to use, which is, you don't remember what happened. What you remember becomes what happened. So the whole idea that actually, and we, we all know can, this. Can you say that again? Yeah, you, you don't? don't remember what happened. What you remember becomes what happened. So I think many people have had this experience. You've not seen a friend for years and you reminisce about an event that you both went to. It was a very memorable event and, you, you know, it's a treasured memory for both of you. And you start comparing notes about the event and you realise that your memories of the event don't match totally. You know, That's interesting. You know, you, you have a memory that she was wearing a beautiful pair of red shoes and she said, no, no, they were black. And she has a memory that, um, that you had a glass of champagne and you said, no, no, I, I was drinking, I was driving, I was just drinking coconut water. And you're like, well, how can this be? How can our memories? And, and these are good friends, you know, we thought, we thought, thought similarly. I'm, I'm not sharing this with an alien from another planet. I'm thinking, well, of you know, his memory's just rubbish or her memory's just inaccurate. You suddenly realise that there's a whole mismatch. It's how false memories work. Is a, is a, can you compare a thought uh, with uh, something like, something unique like your eyes or your, your face or your, is, is, it, is it unique the way you think? Well, I think memories are unique, yes. Um, I think it's very interesting that we often think of memory as being an accurate repository of the past, but it isn't. Our memories are extremely subjective and they're seen through our own eyes. So um, in our work with the captured thought, Clive and I talk about memory as being the door to identity because our memories shape who we are and our identities, our individuality, shapes the way in which we choose to record and remember those instances that then become our memories. And that's why we don't remember what actually happened. We have a subjective take on it. We remember those bits that are of interest and relevance to us. And quite often we can discover that there are aspects of our memory that didn't even happen at all or happened in quite a different way. 
Um, we can do that by sharing our memories with others and discovering that there are bits of my memory and your memory of the same event that don't match. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done on the notion of false memory by Elizabeth Loftus, where she's found that the way in which you phrase a question can bias people to remember things in quite a different way from the way it actually happened. So you might show somebody some a footage of an event, let's say it's a car going at 20 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour, but actually the way in which you phrase the question afterwards that the car smashed into the lorry or the car bumped into the lorry will have a much more dramatic impact on the memory that that person has of the event than the actual speed that the car was going. False memory. memory yeah. Yes, yes, memory. Um, oh yeah, well, well does, it say, does it mean that, that, um, that the way we remember uh, uh, you, you said that, that that determines our identity. That's right. So it's very personal, the way you think. Yeah, yeah. That memories are subjective experiences. So there are no two memories alike from different persons? Well, I think that they're all different. You know, even if it's with a loved one with whom you're very close and and you know, feel that you think in the same way, your memories are still going to be slightly different because you know, they're seen through a different set of eyes and they're being filtered through a different mind because everybody's experiences are different from one another. So I think even two identical twins would still have slightly different memories. Oh, wow, well, that's, that's interesting. I never, I never looked at it like that. I thought, well, if you have been at the same occasion, then you must remember yeah. the same things. Yeah, but we put our own subjective stamp on it. And that's, I think, where integrating science and the arts to study these kinds of questions becomes so important and so insightful, because it's easy as a scientist just to, to think very objectively and go, these, these are the things that have been remembered. That here's a list of things that happened in this event. It happened in this particular room at this time of day, on a particular date. She was wearing this, he was wearing that. But that's not how our memories work. They're not just a series of labels. A series of facts. A series of facts. It's about the, the emotional experience and, and that's the difference, perhaps, between... That's one aspect of why I would call it a thought. You know, a series of facts or, or labels is extremely... could be extremely objective, but your thoughts are personal and they're subjective. And sometimes they can change depending on how you're feeling on a particular day. So you may revisit a memory, and in consequence of which you actually change it. You don't just revisit it and go down the list of things that happen, but all of a sudden, because of something else you've discovered in the interim, or because of a different mood that you're in, or well-being, you reshape it. So can you say that, 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 that the, the factual memory, or the, the facts you remember are objective, but, but but because who you are and and uh, and because there's time, um, the, 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 it gets uh, filtered through your mind, gets subjective, and then that's that's how a thought is created. Well, sort of. I think it's a bit more complex than that. I mean, you, you do more have complex. Yeah, because <laughs> I think well, I think that there are are factual labels that. We remember with precision, London's the capital of England. No idea how I know that information. I don't have a memory of how I learned the information, but it's just something I know. And that's not going to change. I'm not going to revisit my knowledge that the fact that London is the capital of England, that's not going to change. But much of our memories are not 
purely factually based. They have all these other components to them. And the difference there, I think, arises, A, because we've each got a unique pair of eyes and a unique mind that's filtering all those things, as, as you said. But I think it's also because we're selective in our attention. So we also don't see everything that's going on. And therefore, another reason why we might have different memories of the event, quite aside from we've got different eyes and different minds, is that my viewpoint of what I see is different to your viewpoint of what you see. So we can both be looking at the bird. And I know that when you're looking at the bird, there's, there's stuff behind me that you're going to see. And similarly, you know that when I'm looking at the bird, I can see Clive and I can see the background wall over there, which is not something that you can see at the moment because you're looking at the bird and you're looking at me. So that's a selective attention difference as well as a filtering difference. So that's what I meant. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I understand, uh, surely. Um, um, well, uh, when, you, when you try to uh, research crowds or children, um, how hard is it to try to understand alien brains? <laughs> Yes, well, it's... <sighs> is it? Is it alien? Well, I suppose it depends on your point of view. I've spent so many years trying to think about what it's like to be a bird that, for me, it's not very alien at all. Um, but at another level, of course, it's alien because however hard I try to imagine what it's like to be a crow, I'm not a crow and I never will be, sadly. And however much I think about how children might be thinking. It's a long time, sadly, since I was a child. And even when I was a child, I wasn't the same as the children I'm investigating because we have all these individual subjective differences we've been talking about. So all you can do scientifically, I think, is to present various kinds of problem and ask how the subjects, be them crows or children or adult humans, are solving the task. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to look at what the constraints on the thinking are, what the milestones are, and how much individual differences there are in what those milestones are, both within children and within the crows. Well, what, are, what exactly are you looking for? I don't know what you mean by that. Well, uh, somehow there is a you feel the need to, to to research this, find out how thinking works, and and s somehow try to find a, a kind of secret because we don't know, and you want to find out. That's right. So I'm I'm interested in knowing what the constraints are on our thinking processes and thinking about... But is there a reason why you, you do this? Um, well, I've always wanted to know what it's like to, to think like a bird, that's for sure. But I'm also interested in knowing whether there are new ways of thinking that we're not aware of but that by understanding better what some of these constraints are on our thinking processes, that, make, that might give us clues into what these new ways of thinking might be. And that's where the work that I do with Clive on the captured thought, that's where that is so critical, because by bringing in these different perspectives and trying to understand more about what those fundamental features are, that might help us better understand how we could improve our thinking skills or think in new ways that we're not aware of at the moment. Are you able to think in different uh, ways? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think... Um, so you can think in words, but, but... I think most of us can think 
without words as well, as I've, as I've said to you before, you know, when Clive and I are dancing tango together, I'm not... But I try to understand, too, because uh, if I think, I, uh, well, I probably think in words, but, but I haven't never had a thought about it. <laughs> uh, uh, so I try to be aware of, of the, the, the different ways I can think. Okay, or well, our viewers can think. Yeah. Well, let me try with an example then um, of something more simple. Do you like wine? Mm -hmm. Okay. So imagine I've just poured you a glass of wine and you take a sip of it and it's really nice. It's the nicest wine you can ever remember tasting. and You have this gorgeous experience. Words aren't really going to describe for you that experience of the taste of that exquisite wine. You know, we, we use artificial words, do so, don't we say, this one's got lots of cherries in and black currant, but, you know, it's, it's a glass of wine and it's made from grape juice. There aren't any cherries or black currants really in there. These, they're, they're only labels that we're trying to attach to these things to share our experiences of this thing that's really an experience. It's not and, and the words are only a, a rough approximation of a way of sharing the experiences. So that's the kind of thing that I suppose I mean. And somehow just putting words on it in the same way as I, I said with, with the tango, you know, just saying, well, Clive led me into a backward ocho or something. It, it, it doesn't describe the exquisite experience of dancing tango. It, it's just a label for whether I put my feet forwards or backwards, but it doesn't really capture, it captures the tiniest little aspect of the... So, words fall short. Words fall short, yeah. Um, for thinking. For thinking. I never looked at it like that. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible not to think? Ah. Uh. Yes, when you're dead. <laughs> I think it's pretty impossible not to think when you're alive, though. Whether you're aware of the thoughts is another matter. So there are, you know, interesting cases of people who don't necessarily have conscious access to their thoughts. Um, a classic case of that would be you know, an amnesic with severe memory loss who doesn't have access to. They've witnessed the event, but somehow the events haven't been... They don't have a conscious access to what happened at all. Or patients with blind sight who can see, but they're not aware that they can see. So if you ask them, well, did you see that? They said, no, 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 I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything, I'm blind. But then if you say, just guess, they're highly accurate. So their eyes have seen it, but their brain hasn't registered the information that they've actually seen it. Have you ever considered the thought that um, when you die, that the only thing that survives is your, are your thoughts? No. I, I just come up with that because you say, well, you stop thinking when you're dead, but maybe then only your body dies. You understand what I mean? Yeah, but where would those thoughts go? I don't know. <laughs> 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 I tried to think out loud. It just yeah. Maybe that would be interesting because, because, because it's, it's hard not to think. The thoughts do carry on in actual fact because they're carried on within the culture and within society, aren't they? 
you know, uh, it's, 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 music it's, by Beethoven, for example, doesn't it's, sound it's, like it's, it's a bit hard to, to, if you answer the questions and we cannot film you, you understand? No, no, I, no. Was, I was just adding something to your question. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, that's, I, I, that's why I didn't, didn't listen to uh, too well. Maybe you can... No. Uh, I was pro only prompting you to ask, uh, to, to ask the next question, uh, okay. which was um, that the thoughts of one person don't necessarily die when they die, if those ideas are culturally relevant, ah, okay. right. uh, they're yeah, 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 yeah. transferred to the next yeah. generation. Yeah. yeah, thank yeah. you, Dan. That's a good. That's a good. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I suppose uh, that's. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I suppose that's where memory as a shared experience comes in. That although the. What? Sorry, where does it come in? Memory as a shared experience comes in. The whole idea that. Although your thoughts and your memories are individual, they're personal and subjective to you, you can nonetheless share them with others. And in, in multiple ways, right? You can share them by discussing with one another, like we're doing here. You can share them by creating something exquisite, that, like a Beethoven symphony that, that lives on long long after Beethoven himself, um, or a beautiful piece, of, beautiful piece of literature that the author dies, but nonetheless, all the thoughts as represented in the novel remain. So in all those ways, the thoughts can live on. Although, of course, there's a sense in which they live on and a sense in which they die, because the subjective experience of the originator of the thought those thoughts have died, but the shared experience of the thoughts and the way in which that, those thoughts are interpreted by others live on. And I suppose that's what history does, isn't it? You have these ideas that are recorded, but actually, as others revisit the history, just as a memory is changed when it's revisited, so is history, so are the thoughts. So there's a level at which they live on, but they don't, they are changed. But they also get richer, somehow, because now we know this music and this music and this music, and still we, 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 we manage to, to, to make new uh, music, which is beautiful. Yeah, yeah, and the way in which it's interpreted will change because of the new technologies, because of the new experiences. Yeah. So, in a way, these thoughts and these memories are, are much more than just this little snippet of factual, accurate information about the past. They infuse and pervade our history and our culture. Good and bad. Good and bad. And our evolution, if you like, as a species. Um, so why do you want to fly? <laughs> I don't know how to put that into words, really. Um, I've always been fascinated by what it's like to be a bird. I've always been fascinated with being able to move in a three-dimensional world instead of being stuck on terra firma. Um, it's just... It feels like it's a fundamental feature of me, and yet somehow I have difficulty verbalising it, perhaps because the kind of subjective experiences and thoughts associated with wanting to fly and wanting to be a bird are largely wordless. So what is it? If it aren't words? If they aren't words? Thoughts, wordless thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. But so, somehow there must be an origin of you as a child <laughs> thinking, oh, I would like to fly. I suppose it's the freedom, isn't it? And the, the whole idea of being able to 
explore the world from up above to be in the sky and look down and see more and see further. Um, and, and just see that you could have a totally different perspective on how the world looks. You still have this wish? Yeah, yeah. Very much so. But somehow I don't have words that really do it justice. It's strange. Is this a wish you have all your life? Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and how do you keep this alive? Or do you keep this alive or, or do you need this idea to keep on going? I don't think of that it like that. It's just part of me. It's yeah, well, I, I, I don't think of, of flying like a bird, so there, yeah. there's something in you, inside you, which... Yeah. which yeah. Uh, well, I suppose we all have our spirituality, don't we? We all have those things that we identify as being sort of core features of, of ourselves. And for different people, they're different things, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, when we go tomorrow to this lab, yeah. we will see a uh, lot of children. Or is it the yeah, day after tomorrow? Yeah, uh, we're doing children tomorrow and the day after, I believe. Oh, okay. Elsa's got the yeah. program. Um, uh, so, what, I, what do you hope to find out with these uh, tests or, or procedures? or? Well, let, let's talk about that when we do the, because there's lots of different ones. Oh, okay. So okay. I'd rather kind yeah, of yeah. do it with the test yeah, there, because otherwise okay. it's going to be a bit that's okay. jumbled that's and okay. jarbled, I think. Yeah. So when you dance, you dance everywhere? What do you mean? Well, did you dance uh, outside or at home or at, at the lab or, or at a... At the club, or uh, uh, this dancing, you mean, this tango dancing, what do you do there? We go to milongas, which are dance halls, um, that's the main place you do tango, and we do them in our talks and performances. Okay. And yes, sometimes we dance at home. Hmm. Yeah. Well, but the last question, but why the tango? Because you're both not from Argentina. Gosh, I don't know how to answer that either, really. It's, it's the poetry of, me, of movement, I think, tango. It's such a beautiful dance because it's, you're so connected with your partner. You know, it's, they, they talk about it as being um, four legs and an animal with four legs and two beating hearts because you're so connected. So, you know, there's many forms of dance that I, I love. I, I, you know, I, I love ballet and... Salsa is great fun, but there's something very powerful about tango because of the connection you have with your partner, so the leader and follower, and the way in which you respond as one to the music. I think it's very, very special. Does every scientist have this art artist inside? Sorry, does every... Does every artist, uh, every scientist have an artist inside? I don't know. Um, um, I, I, it's not very common, is it, to be a scientist and be artist in residence somewhere. And equally, of course, the other way around. Clive is artist in residence yeah. in the psychology department. So I think we've got something there that is quite unique. You know, you, you do hear of artists in residence, but typically they're short-term residences of three months or at most a year. And usually it's the artist comes into a place, talks to people and then creates a piece of art. Whereas I think that the captured thought, the work that Clive and I do, is truly collaborative. It's not Clive comes and has a cup of coffee with me and then creates something. I have a chat with Clive and go off and do an experiment and occasionally we meet up and talk about them. I mean, the whole project that we're doing is, is um, interwoven together. So all our talks are written jointly and performed 
jointly and it's it's 50 percent you know you might think of it as being 50 percent Nicky and 50 percent Clive but really it's it's more like two percent Nicky two percent Clive and 96 percent Nikki and Clive integrated and 2% I'm only saying because you know obviously one voice is speaking while the other is silent and then vice versa but all the all the thoughts and all the ideas are a collaborative mixture and I hope and I think that as a result it's like a gestalt phenomenon that we're being able to share more and do more than either of us could do alone. I certainly feel that I wouldn't have got nearly so far in my thinking about things if it hadn't been for Clive and I collaborating. And it's not just an odd discussion here and there, it really is this integrated, interwoven, working together and thinking together um, and trying to make new connections between disparate sources that alone I wouldn't have thought of but together with Clive we you know we can kind of push each other to explore further so that's why I feel that it's it's more than what you normally see in a collaboration it's 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 an integration